Well, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 2 again this morning. I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn there. It's good to see everyone. I love this weather. It feels like Christmas when it's like this, and uh, it's great to be here today. The title of today's message is Christmas in the Way, because the true meaning of Christmas can really get in the way of a lot of things that we have going on. And so we're in this message series, and the message series is called Me and Christmas, understanding that the best way to get Christmas in me is to put me in Christmas, is to put myself maybe in the cast of characters of one of those people that were there in that first century Christmas morning, and to walk in their shoes a little bit to see what their response was and how even my response might be very similar. Well, today we're going to look at uh, the villain of the story, the original Grinch of the very first Christmas, a guy named Herod. You know, there are two sides to every story, aren't there? If you have more than one child, you know this to be true. There are two sides to every story. What we find here in the Gospel of Matthew is a different side of the Christmas story than that which is recorded in Luke. In Luke chapter 2, in Luke's version, we read about a nice pretty baby, about shepherds, about Joseph, about Mary, about angelic choirs. Very beautiful, beautiful story. But here in Matthew, the whole context of the birth of Jesus is illustrated. In Matthew's gospel, it is expressed differently. In Matthew's gospel, there's the recording of troubling dreams about Joseph, or that Joseph had, sleepless nights. Mary's pregnancy is a scandal in Matthew's gospel. Joseph speaks of divorce. You add to all that an evil king, which is who we're going to look at today, and you see a whole different side of the story. Now, both sides are absolutely true, and both sides are very real. And both sides are necessary for us to understand the full Christmas story. In fact, I would say this, we really don't understand what Christmas is all about until we look at Herod and we look at this evil king and we see the context in which Jesus was born because in him we see the reality of the world in which we live. And even in his response, we might even see a little bit of Herod in our own hearts. See, in Luke, we read about the mystery and the beauty of Jesus' birth. But in Matthew, we understand the cynicism and the cruelty of the sinful world in which we live. In Luke, we understand the love and grace of Christ's birth. Here in Matthew, we understand the selfishness of the culture in which he was born. And again, both are absolutely essential to understanding the true Christmas story. So let's read it together. Matthew chapter 2, it's the same passage we looked at last week. We're going to read a little bit more than what we read last week, and we're going to look at it from a different angle. This is what it says. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Of course, this is the prophecy from Micah. It was very obvious to the scribes and to the leaders of the Jewish faith where the Messiah would be born. That would be at Bethlehem. Verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was born. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure and, and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, 
they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So we read about a king who had plans, who had plans for his own life. And sure enough, Christmas, the true Christmas, was getting in his way. Let's talk about this villain. Let's talk about this guy named Herod. Herod was placed in power by the Roman authorities in 37 B.C. So by the time that Jesus was born, Herod had already established himself as an authority for many, many years, decades, as a matter of fact. He was named the king of the Jews. Isn't that interesting, knowing what Jesus was called? He was named king of the Jews. He was primarily named that because uh, he was given rulership over the epicenter of the Jewish faith and the region of the Roman Empire where the Jews were mostly located. But he was also called that because he was influenced by the Jewish faith. Never came, became a true believer, but Herod was smart. Herod was smart in that he was a sweet talker, and he would try to incorporate certain things into his own life as a way of gaining favor with the leaders of the Jewish faith. This was a ploy of his. And so he was nicknamed King of the Jews. And I want to share with you as we begin, just to give us some background about Herod so we can reflect upon our own lives. Taking a closer look at this original Grinch, first of all, we see in his life an absolute preoccupation with power. I mean, if power were an alcoholic beverage, Herod would have been drunk on the floor because he was absolutely preoccupied with gaining power. His whole life was about the accumulation of power. He was appointed to political office. His first appointment was at age 25. And in his first act, in that political appointment, he went and he captured a criminal and he had had him publicly executed. He did this because he would gain favor with the Romans by doing such a thing. In fact, he got in a lot of trouble with his immediate superior. And his superior called him in. When Herod showed up here for this, uh, uh, this investigation, Herod showed up in a purple and red scarlet robe with bodyguards all around him. He was sending a signal that he was uh, attaining power and was going to achieve this in his life, even to those who were above him. He gained favor with Caesar and quickly worked his way up. And it wasn't long before he had accumulated all the power that he wanted. He was like a mafia kingpin, but one who had political office. Secondly, he was preoccupied with possessions. This was a distinguishing mark of Herod compared to other kings. Herod went on a spending rampage. (laughs) Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Went on a spending binge. He viewed himself as a Caesar. And so whatever Caesar had, the Roman emperor had, he wanted to accumulate also. He was into building things, building things that would reflect his glory. Let me read for you from history the things that Herod had built. Herod had seven palaces built in his lifetime, each one complete with swimming pools, aqueducts, guest quarters, dining halls, recreational facilities, and bathhouses. He built 12 Olympic-sized swimming pools in his palaces in the desert country. He built seven theaters, one that seated 9,500 people, one of the largest in the world at that time. He built stadiums for sporting events, one of which was uncovered just in 1993. They found out that it seated over 300,000 people. Herod absolutely loved his stuff. One of his palaces was, in fact, so large, it was called the Herodium. 
It was built into the mountains, ironically enough, around Bethlehem. When it was built, it was the largest palace of his day. See, the single defining characteristic, not only of Herod, but of those who followed him, the Herodians, was materialism. He was all about gaining possessions. He was also obsessed with a preoccupation with prestige. He loved to make an impression. Herod actually built cities, too. He built state-of-the-art cities. And what he would do as a way of gaining favor with superiors is that he would name these cities after his superiors. In fact, one of those cities is mentioned in the New Testament. It's the city called Caesarea. He built in that city an amphitheater that seated 4,500 people. Do you know it's still used in today's world for rock concerts there in Caesarea? Sailors, as they were coming in to port, would look at the city of Caesarea, and they would say that it had so much marble in it that it would glisten in the evening from the sheer marble that was there. So he tried to gain favor and prestige with those who were above him. He also married politically. He had ten wives. He married ten women, all for political advantage. And the history records that he really only loved one of them. And I'm going to share with you what he did to that person that he supposedly loved here in just a moment. He was all about working his way up the ladder. Finally, he had all these preoccupations, but it only gives light to the fact that he had an extreme case of paranoia. Obviously, right? Herod's father himself was a politician. And uh, Herod's father was deceived into having dinner with some so-called friends. And Herod's father in that dinner was poisoned. And so that kind of put in Herod's mind and heart this paranoia. Years later, he invited these men to a dinner of his own. And when they arrived, he had his hit men murder them there on the spot. In Herod's final years which, by the way, is where we arrive here at the birth of Jesus. He had ruled for decades, but by the time Jesus is born, he is getting close to the end of his life. By those final years, he had extreme paranoia. He had built many fortresses throughout the city, kind of a CIA network, if you will, so he could escape, but also he had eyes and ears throughout the city so he could hear of any uprisings or any kind of rebellion that was going to rival his kingdom. He thought everyone was out after his power as he got into his old age. Remember the wife that he had loved? Her name was Miriam. He became suspicious of her, and he had her executed. He didn't think too much of her mom either. He had his mother-in-law executed. He began to feel suspicious of two of his sons. He had two of his own sons executed. And within five days of his death, he grew suspicious of a third son. Five days before he died, he had a third son executed. (laughs) He was an extreme man with extreme paranoia. Now, earlier, I had mentioned to you that he had been influenced by the Jews. Thus, he had gained the name King of the Jews, right? Well, since he wanted to gain favor with the Jews, he would not eat pork, because Jews, of course, did not eat pork. And so uh, there was a joke in that day about Herod that it was safer to be a pig in his kingdom than to be one of his sons. That's how ruthless he was. The original Saddam Hussein here. This is the context. So we read about the wise men last week in Matthew 2, 1 through 11. Here, Matthew 2, 1 through 18, we're looking at another character, this guy named Herod. And now that you've seen this guy, this is what I want to talk to you about today. I want to ask you to reflect a little bit. You say, well, I'm certainly not like that guy. I understand that. But I think there are stories included in the scripture for very specific reasons. And I think even this story about Herod has a way of reflecting back to you and me. Because some of the motivations that he had in his life, honestly, are motivations that I see in my own. So let's examine the Herod in our own hearts for a moment. I think it's true that many of us have an obsession with up, with the word up. It's the opposite of the word down. (laughs) 
It's not the same as staying at the same level. An obsession with up. You know what Herod demanded be, to be called? Herod the Great. Herod the Great. With a title like that, I don't think you're going to gain too many humility awards, and certainly he didn't. In our own lives, we can look at our own lives and see kind of an obsession with up. That more is always better. That bigger is always better. See, he had the disease that I think many of us share. As I was reflecting about this this week, I was, I was thinking about this aspect and how this really kind of works in my life and uh, how I've seen it expressed time and time again and how I, I regret the expression of that. This, this obsession with more, this obsession with up, this thing that could never really ever be reached because there's always more up, isn't there? In fact, the less that I feel today was the more that I felt yesterday. And what this plays out in my life, I bet it's true in yours too, is this word that's called jealousy. Jealousy. So I look at others and I compare and contrast my life with them and inherently is a motivation for more. It's all about escalating my way up, ascending into greatness in some way, accumulating more. And this week, what was really true for me is the motivation here, not with respect to me and the jealousy for me necessarily, but it gets expressed through my children. I see them and I compare to other children and I place all kinds of pressure on them and you know, motivate them to achieve more and get them more involved in more activities. It's more, more, this, this, that. And it's not about them. It's about me. It's about me assigning them some place that I call important. You know, Herod was a poster child, really, for upside-down importance, where he valued things that really were not all that important. And I think one of the messages of Christmas, that if we miss, we really miss the true meaning of Christmas. In contrast to Herod and his accumulation of stuff and his desire for more and more and more, we see the simple beauty of the baby in the manger. See, Christmas to me, when I'm in my right mind and heart, is contentment. It's not about getting presents or about getting more. It's not even about skipping past it to the new year. It's about stopping and thanking God for what I have. And when I am content, it really does a couple things in my life. It allows me to see the blessings that I have. It allows me to actually experience joy in my life. Our obsession with up is real, and it's something that reflects upon each one of us next. We see in Herod's heart, maybe something in our heart, and that is this equation of the real versus the religious. The real versus the religious. You see, Herod had all the signs of external religion, didn't he? All the signs. He used the word worship here when he was talking to the Magi. Go and find him and I will come and worship him. He had learned from the scribes and the Pharisees God's word. The word is revealed in Micah about where the Savior would be born. So you contrast verse 8 with verse 11. Look with me in just a moment here. Verse 8 as compared to verse 11. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And I think the Magi knew what was going on. That this was a hoax. This was a game that he had played. Compared that with verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child, his mother Mary. They bowed down and they worshipped him. Big contrast. We have one who's filled with pretense, who is experiencing Christmas and not having a a, a real faith. We see with the Magi instead that they were about having real faith. See, Herod was very religious, but he lacked authenticity in his heart. People come to worship services for all kinds of reasons. Some, believe it or not, come to churches and join churches because of political reasons. It's a status symbol. And I think what Christmas reflects back to you and me, as we see with Herod, is how real is our faith? How genuine is our worship? 
It goes beyond acknowledging and just recognizing. But it goes to the heart of surrendering ourselves to Christ. Which leads to the last thing I want to say. We see with Herod, we see in ourselves that Jesus was a threat to his kingdom. It just might be so that Jesus is a threat to our own little kingdom. Recorded here in Matthew 2 is the story of the killing of the innocents, an actual historical event where Herod and his soldiers rode into Bethlehem and into the surrounding area and slaughtered all the male children under two years old. Horrific event. A genocide, if you will. This is what I want to say about that. That story is very important, really in two ways. The first way is this. Jesus coming at Christmas time is a threat to evil in the world. Just as it was then. You've got to understand this. That Christmas is not just about chestnuts roasting on an open fire and a nice tree and the presents and all those kinds of things. Christmas is about this. God coming in the flesh, thereby God waging war on evil. That's what it was. And despite the evil that we see in the world, we shake our heads and we say, how in the world could that happen? How could this take place? We remember at Christmas time that Jesus coming is God conquering evil ultimately. That one day there will be a reckoning. And because he came in Bethlehem, he will come again. And he will be victorious over all evil in the world. And he will bring justice to this world. The Christmas story is clear. And it's wonderful and it's beautiful. No one, no one has the power to stop God and his plans. Not you, not me, not Herod. But there's another point of application, I think, that maybe hits a little closer to home. Certainly, Jesus is a threat to evil in this world. But Jesus also is a threat to our own little kingdoms that we have built up. Jesus is a threat to our own rulership of our lives. I mean, let's give Herod credit. At least Herod did not assign Jesus the label of the nice little baby in the manger. And I think the reason why Matthew included this, of course, we learned that Matthew's purpose in writing the gospel is about illustrating the Messiahship of Jesus, that he is a king, not an earthly king, but that he is a king and has a kingdom of the heart. And at least Herod got that. At least Herod understood that that baby in the manger meant something to his life. And he didn't assign it just a place, a category out there. Well, it was real nice and it was pretty and, you know, there were angels and all that kind of thing. And it's a tree and it's presents. He understood that this was God in the flesh. He understood that that power held a threat to his kingdom, which may be very true for you and me today. Because it goes to the heart of the ownership of our lives. Does Christmas send a message to you about Christ being ruler of your heart? What part of your life is not under the complete authority of Jesus? What part of your life does Christ does not rule? And maybe Christmas, the true story of Christmas, is kind of getting in the way of you building your little kingdom and your world, and the selfishness, and the materialism, and the need for prestige, and the desires for power. See, that speaks to the heart of every one of us. What area of your life, what area of my life, is not under the authority and rulership of the King, Jesus? Because it is those areas of our lives 
where Jesus is not Lord are the very areas that he will threaten. That's the message of Christmas. And see, he comes to our lives and he demands not just to be that little baby in the manger, but he demands to be recognized as God and as ruler. And Herod got that. And we need to get that. Luke chapter 2, verse 11, I think the verse is up here on the screen. Look at it. It says, today, isn't that wonderful? That day, when the angels announced this, today in the town of David, a what? Savior has been born to you. He is what? Christ, the what? Lord, the angels wanted to be absolutely sure that these shepherds understood who Jesus was. A Savior has been born to you, and He is Christ the Lord. A Savior who came to die for the sins of the world has been born to you. He is Christ the Messiah, and He is the Lord. You don't think that threatened Herod? Absolutely it did. Because what would grow up is one who would become known as King of the Jews. And ultimately that title would lead to his death. That is why Herod with all his might sought to extinguish extinguish Jesus because he was a threat to his kingdom. And if you put Christmas aside... If you don't let the full effect of the message sweep upon your heart and across your heart, you and I do the same thing that Herod did. And that is we don't recognize, nor do we deal with the truth and the reality that Christ is Lord. He desires to be Lord, not just generally. He desires to be Lord of your life. Ruler of your heart. That's the place he longs for. C.S. Lewis has a wonderful, wonderful saying about the place assigned to Jesus. Because in our modern world, there's the nice little Christmas stories, and those are great, nothing wrong with that. But if we're not careful, they begin to water down what Christmas was really all about not only out there, but also in here. Look at what C.S. Lewis says. He says, A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would not just be a great moral teacher. (laughs) He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg. And think about it for a moment. Jesus said, I am the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. C.S. Lewis is making a great point. He's saying, listen, a man who would claim to be something like that would either be a lunatic, which is absolutely inconsistent with who he was, or else he would be the devil of hell. He would be evil, which again is absolutely inconsistent with who Jesus was. C.S. Lewis says this, you must make a choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him. You can kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about him being just a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. It's not an option that we have. You see, a little baby in the manger is not very threatening. But a king, a ruler, is a power that must be answered to and is a force that must be reckoned with. What will be your choice this Christmas? Will you respond in worship to him? recognizing him for who he truly is. That's my prayer for us all. Let's pray together, okay?